Sometimes devotions run into you. Sometimes you run into them. And not long ago, I had another of those experiences of having a devotion just run directly into my heart space. What do you really believe to be true? What is really certain in your life? When I was a kid, we used to say a lot of things that we don't say anymore, but one of the things we said a lot, you bet your life. You ever heard anybody say that? You might have friends in your family still say it. You bet your life. Question, what is it in your life, in my life, that you can bet your life on? I mean, no strings attached. You can bet your life on. I'm going to share a little bit of my own witness with you, and you can put together yours. You need to. But what is certain in an uncertain world? What can you bet your life on? The first thing is, God is. God exists. There are lots of questions. There are a lot of doubts. There are lots of misunderstandings. Just this last week, I had to say to somebody, uh, why is it that God did this? And I said, I don't know. I don't know the answer to why. It's the how can I deal with it where I find God helpful. I think we're all in that sort of circumstance. We, not long ago, we told this story here across the years, but we had a girl that went off to college, and she lived in one of the little houses here, a little one of the little shanties, and when she came home for Thanksgiving, they were setting the living room up as a place to eat together, and Mama asked her daughter to pray the blessing, and the daughter said, ah, I'm not into that anymore. You know, I've been off to college, and I'm sort of away from all that stuff, and the Mama said, honey, will you please do the blessing? Uh, we're all ready to eat, and we're hungry, and she said, Mama, I'm not doing that anymore. And the mama said, honey, in this world, there is still God. Now pray. And the daughter said, let's pray. Now, it's kind of a sweet story. And the truth is, it's not going to change somebody who's really looking for the truth. But what I find about a conviction that God exists is that it satisfies more intellectual needs than any other option. It makes more sense than any other approach. Even with problems, there is a certainty in my heart, in my life, that God is and that God will be. And for that, all I can do is say, thanks be to God. The second thing that I believe is absolutely certain is this, that life is grace, that life is gift, that all life is nothing in the world but grace. Did you ever stop to think about it? What do you have that you have not been given? Now, a lot of people will say, well, I'm a self-made person. I got out there and I hustled and I made money and I made a name for myself and all that stuff is great. But where did you get the life that hustled and made money? It's all gift, I'm telling you. It's all grace. And I'm absolutely certain that if life is gift and if life is grace, then the best thing that we can do is to say, let's say thank you, God, and see what we can do with it. Which leads me to another certainty. And that is that there are, no in, there are no moments in life that are incidental. No incidental moments in life. Every moment is a key moment. This morning when I woke up, I realized that I wasn't coughing as bad as I had been coughing. And so I said, thank you, God, for a night's sleep and for a morning without coughing. Now, to somebody who hadn't been in a situation like that, that may not be very meaningful, but it's an honest response to a moment with a capital M, are a key moment. Now, sometimes those are moments like this. I can remember distinctly standing at the altar with dear Pat and promising our life and love together. And I can remember at her funeral, the bishop raising her hands in praise and adoration to God as she began to consecrate the sacrament. Moments, moments alive. I can remember times when I'm standing baptizing a baby and walking that baby up and down the aisle and feeling the embrace of the entire congregation onto the life and child that we bless there and feeling that sense of real rejoicing or seeing someone come to faith that had missed the faith for so long or seeing someone that was drunk as could possibly be get sober and get well and to have a church that's willing to celebrate that to say we're going to clap when you have won a victory or when you've overcome a difficulty. There are no incidental moments. It is a certainty that every moment given to us is an opportunity for us to respond in some positive way, I would hope and pray, in some Christ-like way as we continue to do our living. Then something else I believe to be absolute and certain and true, and that is that love is real and that love continues. That love is stronger than death. 
that love is the center of what makes life worth living. And that love is not just a romantic feeling. We've talked about it so many times. But love is actually involving yourself for the good of another person. And that love is that willingness on your part to sacrifice something of who you are in order that the other person might be better. When that happens, it's great. When that fails to happen, it's tragic. But the truth is that there is love. And it really is real. I remember that story of the woman that had such bad Alzheimer's and won the National Poetry Contest for her particular state and was supposed to read her poem. And she couldn't do it, and her husband did it for her. And after he had read it for her on her behalf because she couldn't read her own poetry, she said, this dreadful disease has taken away everything. But there's one thing I do remember. I do remember love. I love that. And I want you to know that there is a God of love who loves you, that there is a God of love that calls you to love others. And sometimes that love stretches our boundaries. From time to time, people will criticize us because we love too much and too broadly. But the truth is, if you love too much and too broadly, all you're doing is expanding who, expanding who God is, if God is love. And so to be able to love a broken world, to be able to love a needy person, to be able to love someone who is like you, to be able to love someone who is not like you, is one of the great certainties that you and I have an option to practice. And I only hope and pray that we will. And the other thing is for us to be able to remember that Jesus is a very special person. That there is so much more to Jesus than we understand. There's something very special about Jesus. I love to repeat it because one of the kids in my philosophy class at Millsaps long years ago, during the class asked me, he said, you're a preacher, aren't you? And I said, yeah. And he said, what's so special about Jesus? In one of those sarcastic ways, you know. And what I didn't expect was to meet him on the campus after that and for him to say to me, I wasn't kidding. I mean, I really was serious because I believe in God. I mean, I believe in something out there. But you all talk about Jesus this and Jesus that. What's so special about Jesus? And, you know, each of us will have to answer that. We'll have to answer that in our own way. What I find special about Jesus is his conception from the beginning. At the first instance of life, we remember something unique about him. I think of his birth. Not a high and mighty birth, but a very with us, low down, common, ordinary, for everybody kind of birth. Not only for the folks, the poor folks and the shepherds, but for the wise men and the kings who came. His life from the beginning was committed to God. When he was 12 years old, they couldn't find him. He was out teaching the teachers. And I think also learning from the teachers. I like to add to that particular story. And learning also how to be an obedient child, you know, because he didn't tell mom and dad where he was going. And uh, so after that, they said he was good again. Jesus wasn't good. Yeah, he was real, you know, all that kind of stuff. And then his death. Here's a person who dies and somehow or the other in dying saves others. People all the time say to me, why don't you plead the blood of Jesus? We were talking about this in the Sunday school class. Um, and I said to that person, I said, I don't like your preaching because you don't uh, plead the blood of Jesus. I said, what do you mean by that? And he said, I don't know. You're just supposed to say it. Isn't that interesting? Let me tell you what I understand. In a man who lives and dies for you and for me, in a man who says on the cross with those nails in his hands inside, Father, forgive them. I find everything I need for the resurrection of my own soul. And so what's so special about Jesus is not only his conception and his birth and his life and his death, but his resurrection. We kidded about this at the early service too. Um, almost every year, there's a guy that comes to church. And on the way out, he, he confronts me. And he's not, he's not kidding. Or at least he acts like he's mad. And he'll say, every time I come to this church, you preach on the same darn thing. And you never preach on anything else. And I said, well, I'm so sorry. What's the problem? He said, every time I come, you preach on the resurrection. And I said, well, come sometime other than Easter. <laughs> he didn't think it was funny. But uh, so there really are some certainties. And in the early service, I had said, that all of this is what love calls from us and that there is no perfect love in the world. We don't find that. But someone who was in our congregation wrote a beautiful piece after that saying, in a moment, in my own personal space, I had this talk and this moment with God where it was a sense of perfect love shared. In that sense, I believe it's possible between you and God. Then what we have to do is translate that into practicing perfect love 
with one another. And why would we do that? Because there are some things in our lives upon which we can say, I'll bet my life that that's true. And what we're really saying is, I'll bet my time and my eternity on those things. So find your certainties and stand on them and then walk with them. And I'll bet you'll change not only the world, but you'll change yourself too. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for the chance that you've given us, not only to be here, but to be present. The word's been preached now. And this is first Sunday, and we have a chance for those who'll do it to spend a moment at the altar in Holy Communion. This is where you come to us in such a special and unique way and give us one more certainty. Make it so, we pray. In Christ our Lord. Amen.